how many of you have experienced, and when I do this, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, keep it up. Okay, don't take it down. How many of you experienced a very significant pain, hurt, or trauma in your life? How many of you experienced? How many of you have ever had any kind, keep your hands up, any, those of you guys that didn't have your hands up, how many of you have had any kind of significant pain, serious pain in life, a difficulty, a hardship, a death in the family, a serious car wreck? Uh, how many of you have ever had uh, a serious sickness? All right, so, so, so I think we got to the point here. To keep your hands up, please, please keep your hands up. Look around, please, just look around and put this in your mind. Settle this in your mind. The ones that didn't raise their hand, I just didn't get a question that would get that up. But so go and put your, head, put your hands down. Did, did you guys see a lot of hands? Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind in this room. A lot of hands. A lot of difficulties. A lot of pain. And I believe if we were asked that question outside of these walls, we'd get the same response. Exactly the same. Keep that in mind. Keep that visual. Just kind of as we're praying, uh, just ask the Lord to burn that visual in your mind, those hands, those hands. Because every single hand that was raised is very significant. You're a person with a family. Uh, you have a mom and dad, a grandma and grandpa. You have kids and grandkids. You're single. You're going through life. At the, the, that, that's, just, just keep that in mind. Don't, don't, lose, don't lose that mental picture. If you don't get anything from our Bible study today, you don't get anything from me being on the stage, don't forget the image. God will forever use that image in your life to not look past the pains and difficulties in people's life so that God can awaken himself in their lives through you, through you. So a lot of pain in this world, a lot of difficulty, and that is an avenue and an open door for God to change lives. So God, we do ask for the working of your Holy Spirit right now. We're so thankful uh, for the time that we spent earlier just really processing um, the beautiful uh, connection between you and religion and science and the wisdom that comes from knowing you personally and how, you know, two books, you know, the book of nature and the, your word, just so powerful. And now, God, as we come to an understanding of, in your word today of the reality of pain, awakened to the God of hope through pain, I pray that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, most people aren't thinking about God every day. They're not thinking about God hardly any part of the day. I, I started just thinking about that as I was driving over here from the hotel. I'm looking at people going through their day and honking their horns, and they've got somewhere to go. And I just made that mental thought. You know, here in Boise, as I was going down the road from our hotel to make a left on coal, and there were all those other cars coming, and then that main highway there, and that whole side of the highway was just full of cars, they weren't coming here. <laughs> they, there wasn't a line of cars. They're not coming here. They got something doing. They got, they're doing something. Uh, they're not thinking about God, most of them. They're not thinking about reality. They're not thinking about salvation. They're not thinking about Calvary Chapel, Boise, or Foothills Church. Or They're not thinking about God. Uh, I mean, they might start to think about God if you ask them. You know, if you go on the street and you put a microphone in front of them, what do you think about God? And you get those kind of answers. And, you know, because most of life is just the daily grind. You know, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? What kind of clothes are we going to have? What's going on with the kids? How do I live in my singleness? I got to go there. I got to pick this up. I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to go to the mall. I'm going to get a new apartment. I just, I, I just lost my, my lease. Uh, you know, that, that's, the car, that's the world that we live in. It's repetitive. It is mundane. It's ordinary. And for the most part, apart from Jesus Christ, people live their life apart from God. God's not in that. They're not thinking about God going to the mall. They're not thinking about God with their clothes. They're not thinking about God. God is not a part of their lives. I, I would dare say that that described your life before you got saved. That described my life. I could care less about God. I wasn't against him. I wasn't verbally going after him. But I didn't care. I didn't care about God. I had a life to live. I got all kinds of things going on. And you know, Jesus spoke to that. Our Jesus, he spoke to that. Because life has a way of lulling us to sleep. Even as believers, we, we can go to sleep spiritually, we can go to sleep practically. Jesus put it this way to the religious leaders of the day. He said, you know the saying, red sky, come, red sky at night means fair weather tomorrow. Red sky in the morning means foul weather all day. You are good at reading the weather, it's signs in the sky, but you can't read the obvious signs of the times. Because we're asleep. That is until tragedy strikes. 
Everything changes when tragedy strikes. People all of a sudden start talking about God. You know, a tragedy like we saw in, in New York, like 9-11. There was a lot of talk about God. God used that as a way to get people's attention. You know, when there's a tragic school shooting, people start to talk about God. When somebody decides and plans for months and months and months to go into a midnight showing of a, of a movie in the Aurora Theater, which was just a few miles, it's just a few miles up from our church, just, just a few minutes from our church, and kill people, and people start to talk about God. Crisis, it hits hard, and it hits fast, and it takes no prisoners. Pain is knocked at the front door of people's lives, and it's moved in without permission and refuses to leave. People talk about God then. They start thinking about the reality. Is there such a thing? It, 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 it changes your thinking. And so questions come up in tragedy, like why, why does a good God allow such evil? That's a good question to ask. I'm glad that people are asking it. It's a great question to ask. And if that wasn't enough, we also live in an age where technology shrinking the world. You, you can pull out, as I could, I could pull out my phone and flip through my Twitter feed and see story after story after story of tragedy. And you know what that does? It numbs me. I don't feel it anymore. You know, we, we now have this instant insight of what's going on in Nepal, but for most of us, we're not there. And if you don't pay attention, it's going to come and go because there'll be another tragedy. But for some people, it gets their attention. It's common to fall asleep to the reality of God, become numb to him. You know, oh, another riot. Oh, you know, another fire. Uh, you know, oh, now all the cities. Now it's not just one, not just Baltimore, but it's Minneapolis and it's L.A. And now, you know, you just kind of look at it. You just got to, well, you know, God isn't good. He doesn't care. He doesn't intervene. That is until, well, until tragedy hits home, close to home. When tragedy hits home, there in those few brief moments of reflection, a person's deep inner questions start to rise. They come to the surface, and all that matters is gaining understanding. It's sort of like getting punched in the gut. Have you ever gotten punched in the gut? Anybody ever get punched in the gut as a kid? You know, you go, oh, 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 oh. And, and all you care about, you know, you don't care about the weather. You don't care about getting an A in math or, you know, my mom's going to catch me doing something wrong. You have one thought, don't you? I got to get my next breath. You know, if somebody came up and go, can you please get out of the way? I'm trying to get in line for lunch. And you're like, I can't breathe, man. What's your problem? Life is like that. And, and, and that punch in the gut often, you know, reveals these, these thoughts like, well, God isn't real. He's just a myth. You're dumb for believing in him. And, you know, that's the popular attitude within the world we live in. Our neighbors think that. Our friends think that. Our coworkers think that. Some of you watching in right now might have that same viewpoint. Oh, until tragedy hits home. You see, in the ministry, if you're looking for a ministry, you're looking for an opportunity, it's been wisely said that if you choose to preach to those that are hurting, you'll never lack an audience. Did you see the hands lifted up? Everybody's going through something. And it's vital, I believe, that we're answering the questions that people are asking. Living out a vibrant faith of a living and a loving God introducing them to the God who knows tragedy personally. God himself, the creator of the universe, knows of which, well, he knows of which what we have experienced in tragedy and trial and difficulty. God's knowledge of pain is not an abstract philosophical theory. He's experienced it. God, our God. It's not a philosophical discussion. It is real. His pain is rooted in history and in time. And it was true, real pain. His own son was viciously and torturously killed unjustly by an unjust government using a torturous methodology that was designed to prolong the agony it was not too many weeks ago that we were talking about Good Friday. Were we not, church? And going through the, the process of what had happened to a man before he was crucified, let alone what happens after as he's hanging on the cross. And the Bible says, if you have your Bibles, you can open them to Romans chapter 5. This is what the Bible says. 
The Bible says that God demonstrated his love. This is Romans chapter 5, verse 8. That God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God the Father knows tragedy firsthand. He doesn't just have a knowledge of watching it occur. Tragedy has struck the heart of God. His son was viciously murdered for your sins and mine. So what's it like? What's it like to watch a son die? Let me tell you, listen. It's horrific. It's horrific. You see, life changed forever on May 4th, 2013 in my life. My phone rang. And on the other end of that phone call was a frantic female voice unable to say anything. The phone was handed over to an Aurora police officer who very calmly with the sirens blaring in the background and the violent weeping in the background, letting me know that my son, 26 years old, healthy, strong police officer, had collapsed in his front lawn and that they had revived him and they're on their way to the hospital. We should get there right away. We were up in Breckenridge with some pastor friends. You know, pastors need time away and we had chosen this weekend. I brought a guest speaker in. We were going to get away to the mountains, not too far away, but just get away. We needed some time to, to rest and relax and share some fellowship with friends. And we were there heading and had already been there on Friday and Saturday. We were um, going to lunch. I remember it like it was yesterday. We were waiting in line. It was the um, Kentucky Derby. Everybody had these, all the women had these beautiful hats on and I had just one hour earlier sent a text to my son. And my text said, thinking of you today, love you, son. And it was just about an hour later, my phone rang. And then, as if in slow motion, after we rushed home to the hospital, Marie and I watched our 26-year-old son lie helplessly in a coma. After his heart failed and was revived, and as his parents, we couldn't help. We couldn't make any medical decisions for him. We couldn't do anything. And so we watched and we prayed. And we desperately pled for our son's life. Only to see the decision made to put him in hospice, not wait for him to wake up. And we watched him die. We worked. We watched him die with great faith and trusting in a faithful God, 24-hour shifts. Marie and I would go 12 hours. She would take the day, and I would take the night, and because we really believed he was going to wake up. And I didn't want him to, when he woke up, I didn't want him to see a nurse first. I didn't want him to see an orderly first. Uh, I wanted him, I know he heard my voice, as I, I wanted him to see me, I wanted him to see his mom, I wanted him to hear our voice, this son, this brother, this grandson, this father, husband, police officer, a lover of Jesus, gone just like that. And some of the hardest, most difficult, darkest days of our lives commenced. And in, Mar in May uh, in 27th of this year, it'll be two years since our son went home to be with the Lord. But I'm here today to declare to you the faithfulness of God. To remind you that God understands pain and is often revealed in the difficulties of life. You see, I know my son Eddie is not just a part of our past. He's a part of our future. And that future is secure in the God of all creation. That in God there is hope. There is stability. And oftentimes God and the hope of God and the faithfulness of God is awakened in a person's life in deep tragedy. And difficulty. Don't be intimidated by the questions, but be ready to answer them. You know, it's been said that a man can live 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes with, without air, and about one second without hope. And we need hope in life to get through. 
We need the stability of God. Guys, listen, I don't know everything there is to know about God, but I do, what I do know reminds me of his faithfulness and his promises. It reminds me that he was faithful when things were going well in my life, and now that tragedy has occurred, God's faithfulness, his presence, and the reality of God hasn't lessened, but only increased. And this is the world in which we live, one that is just absolutely insanely wrecked by sin. It is the, 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 the negative results of sin. Sin. Going in direct, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it, that things are broken on the earth today? Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Things are broken on the earth. They're not getting better and better. They're getting worse and worse. We're seeing things in our generation. Listen, guys, no other generation has seen what we're looking with our own eyes, our own smartphones, our own television. No other generation has seen the kind of things that we have seen. I think the only generation that could come close would be, I guess, you know, Noah. He saw some crazy things. <laughs> Just the world getting destroyed, you know. It's like, that's it. But you know what Jesus said? Hey, in the last days, you know what it's going to be like? The days of Noah. Tragedy opens people's eyes, believer and unbeliever alike. The world is in rebellion against the God who created him. We know that we're children of God, the Bible says in 1 John 5, and that the world around us is under the power and the control of the evil one. You want to know the answer of why there's evil in the world? Because the devil seems to be running the show. And he, only, he doesn't do anything good. Did you know that? He doesn't do anything good. He's only come to steal, kill, and destroy. Stealing, killing, and destroying if you didn't know, are bad things. <laughs> and they happen to good people and bad people. There is a God of this age, little g. The Bible declares him to be the devil himself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, so they're unable to see the glorious light of the good news that's shining upon them because the God of this evil world, Satan, has blinded them. Minds are blinded. But God has not abandoned humanity, you know. Instead, he's permanently invaded time. And what does he desire but relationship? Paving the way, actively be involved in every situation to draw attention to a better home, a better life, a future and a hope. And listen, I'm here to declare to you, friends, listen, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. There's a heavenly hope that's found rooted in a true and righteous God. Man, tragedy is opening up hearts all around us. Tragedy that happens to people, tragedy that's created by people, pains and problems are the very bridge of connection with a world that's abandoned God long ago. That, that is a bridge that we can look for. Oftentimes we can see it in people's eyes. They'll never say a word, but you look in their eyes and the Holy Spirit gives you discernment, gives you word of wisdom, gives you the prophetic power to speak into their life, to gives you insight on their lives that they didn't share with you where God just explodes on someone. How? Through the, the faithfulness of a believer in tune with the Spirit of God. Tragedy is real. One of the greatest manifestations of the kingdom of God on the earth today is his steadfast faithfulness in the midst of great trial, great distress, great difficulty. And for everyone that's raised your hand, that you are still walking with the Lord, you still love God, you still believe, you still worship, your testimony is powerful to the manifestation of the power of God on the earth today. And I know it's tremendously hard. I wouldn't even begin to presume how hard it is for you, but I can speak for myself. It's impossible. It's impossible. I don't know how people apart from God do it. I know how I did it. I got myself drunk when I, before I was saved. I just was drunk all the time. I never wanted to deal with reality. Drugs, alcohol, partying. I, I was just wasting my time and numbing my feelings. And yet God still broke through. He still got my attention. He still represented. He still surrounded me with people. You know, the guy, you know, how I, you know how I got saved is a guy I grew up with, played Little League since I was seven years old with. He, many years later, 15, 16 years later, he invited me to church. That's the same guy I party with, got in trouble with, did things I would never put on video with. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the statute of limitations are, you know? So we'll just, just say, 
All right, we got into a lot of trouble together. But God invaded his life, and God used him to invade my life. And he could see. Now, he didn't know all the details, but my, at the time, Marie and I were married as unbelievers, and we, our marriage was a wreck. He didn't know that, but you know who did? His God. I had him pick up the phone and go, hey, can I just talk to you about God? No. <laughs> and yet still, because he was my friend, he was invited over, and the rest, they say, is history. Hey, the fiery trials in our lives, I've shared with the, some of the pastors and their wives uh, in our conference and the time we spent away up in Garden Valley is, hey, look, trials work for you, not against you. They work for you as a believer. They work in your life. Even You could even say for the life of the unbeliever, trials work for them in the sense of drawing a deeper attention that the things they're facing in their life is not something that they can control and that there is a reality outside of themselves, a reality that's known and revealed himself as God. You see, for us as believers, though, the reality of trials, they develop us. Peter knew. Peter said, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial that's to try you. Don't think it's strange. I like how the message translation translates this. He says, this is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Friends, when, when life gets really difficult, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you are in the very thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. <laughs> I love that. And, and throughout all the history of Scripture, all the people that have had a connection with God, in all their trials, there's only one consistent theme in the life of, of God in relationship to his people, and that is through all their trials, he was faithful. Think about the wilderness. A bunch of rebellious, resistant people that were unappreciative. What did God do for them? Fed them and clothed them and protected them for 40 years. Oh, I know that they had a life that was not going to end in the promised land, but they had a life nonetheless. And God loved them and took care of them. And in the wilderness, even though they had already made their decision against him, in the wilderness, God said over and over and over again, every day they woke up, every day they ate, every day they put on the same clothes, the same sandals, the same message was being given to them. I know it's hard. I know it's hot. I know it's difficult. I know you made a big, big, big mistake. I know there's consequences of that, but I love you. I love you, I love you, and I want to demonstrate my love to you each and every day. And now the Bible says, as we fast forward, that God demonstrated his love to us, how? By sacrificing his own son, Jesus Christ. There's no way whatsoever anyone in this room can escape trials. We look in the past and we all raise our hand, yes, yes, yes. Well, I can say this, in the future, you're going to raise your other hand. Because of sin, everyone's going to die. Everyone's going to get sick. Everyone is going to face calamity and difficulty in their family. Our loved ones are going to die. You know, in this whole time period of, of the last couple years, it wasn't just my son. It really started a couple years ago when we had a serious house fire. I think I shared that the last time I was here. Our house got on fire. We left something on the stove, went to, to dinner, came home. The garage door opened, smoke in the garage. Not a good thing. And while the house didn't burn down to the ground... Enough smoke was in there from the kitchen fire that was going while we were gone that we lost every, all of our contents inside our house and we had to leave while they gutted it and rebuilt it uh, from the inside out for five or six months. I don't even remember how long, but it was a long time. Then just after that, my father passed away. And I'm adopted, a very, just, a, just, I was adopted. I loved my parents and watching my dad pass and his sickness, that was really hard. Not too long after that, I get all these texts in the night, but you know, my phone, it doesn't, Siri talks when I don't want her to, but I don't have, and it, look, I'm even treating her like a person, I'm looking at her and I'm like, she's not real, it's just a phone, man. Gosh. I don't have, you know, if you text me at night, my phone doesn't make any noise. So I got all these texts all night, you gotta watch this. Well, it wasn't until somebody decided, you know, he isn't answering, we should call him that they called me and said, hey man, you gotta watch the news. You gotta get up, get up and watch the news. And of course that day changed the entire direction of our city as I found out that uh, a young man decided to go into a movie theater and kill people. And, and in those two theaters, one where the shooter was and one next to it, we had over 40 people from our church. 
and most of our staff, because most of our staff are young and think it's okay and cool to go to a movie at midnight. Why? I sleep at midnight. They go to movies at midnight. That's cool. I'm all right with that. My son almost went. Uh, my, my middle son, Josh, he almost went, but because he had an appointment, uh, he decided not to go with everyone. So he, he was home because he had a, a doctor's appointment. And, and fortunately, none of those, none of the 40 from our church or so uh, got hurt physically, but mentally, they're forever changed. And if you've noticed on the news recently, uh, the trial has started and it's just surfaced all sorts of things in our community again, which is good, or I should say is bad and good at the same time. Because while the world views evil and pain, they want to dismiss it, explain it away, and pretend it never happened, God wants to use that to infuse grace, mercy, and love, and he wants to use it in a redemptive way. He wants to save people through tragedy. He doesn't want to see lives destroyed through tragedy. Because there's hope after death. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Did you know that? Death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. The worst thing that can happen to you is for you to die in your sins, John chapter 8, and experience eternal separation, as was shared earlier. So death is not the worst. For the believer, your last breath on earth is your first breath in eternity in the presence of the Lord. So you've got, so I got a house fire in, in my life and then, and then my father going into eternity and, and then the theater shooting and then my son's tragedy and then just recently my mom. It just seems like there's a season of tragedy. It just seems a season of tragedy. I don't like it. I don't want it. But you know, I don't wish it on anyone else either. This is my life. Apart from Jesus Christ, I don't think I'd be saved. I don't think I'd be alive. I mean, obviously, I know I wouldn't be saved, but I wouldn't be alive. And so I rejoice in the years that I had with my parents, and I rejoice in the years that I had with my son, and it's still hard, and it's still difficult, and it's still going to be with me until eternity, but there's coming a better day when I'll know even as I'm known, where I'll be reunited with my loved ones, where I'll be in the presence of Jesus Christ, even in a greater capacity and reality than I know now. And I do believe that the best is yet to come, but don't think that any of you are going to avoid trials. You're not. If you had three hands, you'd raise that one too. <laughs> it's going to happen. And God uses trials in our lives to bring about maturity, strength, and trust. How would we ever know? How would we ever know of the faithfulness of God unless we were forced to live out the reality of the difficulty in front of us? How would we ever know what, where we lack in faithfulness until God reveals our own faithlessness? How, how would we ever know how much we're holding on to this temporary, temporal world until we lose something that we value so much and we go, oh, heaven. How would we ever know as we're surrounded by selfishness in this world, how would we ever understand God's graciousness? As we're surrounded by harshness, how would we ever not see his gentleness? You know, as we're surrounded by, by a merciless society, that's a way for God to show his compassion. How would we see a people gripped with fear and not yet be led to the ever-arcing protection of God and his care and concern for our lives? In Psalm 61, verse 1, it says, Hear my cry, O God, and attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I'll cry to you, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. For you've been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I'll abide in your tabernacle forever and I'll trust in the shelter of your wings. That, that psalm is so rich with the reality of difficulty. Psalms were birthed, you know, these beautiful psalms, you know how they were birthed? Under great difficulty. I've become very good friends with David lately. Spent a lot of time in the psalms. Spent a lot of time, you know, we're also as a congregation going through 1 Samuel together for the very first time and just really walking along in the footsteps of Samuel, that great type of the one to come, you know, Samuel and from Samuel into David's life and all the way through and watching that big conflict with Saul and, you know, David is that type of the one to come and it's just like, oh Lord, listen, this is a tried and true tried and tested truth that I'm saying to you now. Put your hope in God. He'll never let you down. It's true. It's true because the Bible says it's true. But let me just say personally, I know it's true because I put it to the test. Let me just say I know it's true because it's been put to the test in my life. I didn't sign up for the test. I didn't sign up for the class. I joined a club that nobody ever wants to join. 
Crisis invaded my life. I didn't ask for it. I didn't want it. But listen, friends, we are not immune. Just because we're believers in Jesus Christ, we are not immune to the pains and problems of life. Things didn't just automatically change. You go, okay, now you're a believer, so for the rest of your life, everything's going to go your way. That's a lie. It's not true. I know a large segment of Christianity today kind of, well, you know, it's just everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be great. Let's just all smile and, and let's live the best life that we can. And, and I would say there's, there's, there's truth in the sense that we want to give God our best. But as you live your life, you are going to experience some of the most horrific, horrendous pains in, 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 that anyone. You're, some of you listening in, you're, 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 you're tracking with me. And yet at the same time, you're going, Ed, that, that's a hard life, but, but you, you haven't heard my story yet. I totally, totally believe you when you think that and say that, that your story is hard. You don't compare trials, you know. You go, well, I haven't experienced that, so my trial or difficulty may not. No, no, no. What you're going through right now and what you're in the midst of right now is everything to you, and I respect that. You don't have to compare to my life. You don't have to compare and say, well, hey, you know, Ed, I'm, that might, you know, are you, are you minimizing what I'm going through? Not at all. I'm actually wanting to elevate what you're going through to the point where you could see the glory of God in your own life and remember that that person on the highway has trials too. I wonder if they know God. And that person that's ringing you up at the check stand in Walmart, you know, they got a hard times too. They probably can barely make it. They're probably barely making it. I wonder if they know God. You know, that person that has those theological, that guy that was on the pier there, you know, giving us his whole philosophy. Things would change when a deep pain hits his life. He may not ever exp express it. But for the skilled man or woman that's in the hands of God, you will be able to navigate into their lives and get behind that whole facade and get behind that whole front and get behind that defensive mechanism to don't let me close, don't get close to me, I don't, don't talk to me, don't even get near me. You know, for that skilled person with the word of God in the hands of the Holy Spirit, you can navigate behind all those defenses and just say, hey, look, bro, there's a God in heaven that loves you. Do you know him? He demonstrated, well, I mean, what is love and who am I? And that, I mean, those are great questions. Who, what is love and who am I? Hey, look, 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 look. <laughs> I have no idea who you are. <laughs> Let's just start there, okay? I have no idea. If you don't know who you are, then you're in trouble, okay? But, you know, I don't know, but I do know this. God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were still yet in our sins, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died and he rose again. God, see, this is a truth. God has been there for me and he'll be there for you. And no matter what you face in life, he'll walk with you through it. The psalmist said it this way. Yet, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. You are either hopeful or hopeless. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 28, the hopes of the godly result in happiness, but the expectations of the wicked are all in vain. And I commend to you today that it is a wise decision to hope in God. And remember, tragedies will lead to triumph in Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, in the simplicity of our time together today and a very simple word that you would explode on us with spiritual power so that we might gain understanding in the reality of, of where we're at and our need for a knowledge of you. Um, like the ocean, Lord, we could never plumb the depths of your faithfulness, your goodness, your gentleness, but we love you. And uh, it hurts, Lord, to be in pain. It hurts. It's just hard. And we acknowledge to you, Lord, our human weakness and ask for you to explode on our lives by your spirit. If you're here today and you, you just need, a, you need to be encouraged, would you just stand to your feet? We want to encourage you. Just, just stand up. You need encouragement for whatever it is. Just stand up. Don't leave here without acknowledging the God of hope. Just, just wherever you're at, just stand up. You, you're just, that's where you're at. You know? and, and I guess maybe God is dealing with your pride right now because you, you're thinking, well, people think I got it all together. We totally know you don't have it all together. Like, you're the only one that doesn't want to acknowledge that. And it's okay. 
just, just like, let, let the Lord shower you with mercy today. Let him remind you he, he loves you. Just acknowledge that. Do something tangible. Like, like I, it's, it's hurting. It's hurting. It's messing up your life. It's a detour in your life. You, and now you, you guys that are around them, just stand up. Lay hands on them. See the people standing and let's be the body right now. You got some up here and over here. You got a couple over here, guys. Some over here. Uh, let's just give a chance for the Holy Spirit to take what we've heard today, let people know we love you, you're important, you're not suffering alone, you aren't forgotten, you are very important to the, to, the love, to the very heart of God. So God, we just pray right now for the work of your spirit, for the hope of heaven. We pray for these hurting people. Um, we pray and left our aches to you. We are not asking you to solve it all because uh, we know ultimately you do solve it all in eternity, but we are asking just for a tender touch of your comfort. Uh, give a, uh, um, you know, like, like the brother that shared the testimony with me, he was so distraught as his child was, was, uh, was a backsliding, backslidden prodigal, but he's home. Maybe people just need today to have the hope that he's, she's going to come home. She's coming home. And that's what we pray, God. We pray for your, the aches and the pains, for the balm of Gilead to flow, that we might then allow us to be a conduit, uh, a, you know, as Bob had shared, the pioneer to blaze a trail of hope in a very hopeless world. So we love you, God, and thank you for the privilege of living our lives to please you. In Jesus' name, amen.